Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on four alternatives for creating effective strategies. We're being led today by James Graham and I'll hand over to him in a moment. But just before I do that, I want to run you through a few very, very brief housekeeping rules that should make the afternoon go smoothly. Um, the slides that you see and the recording of the entire webinar will be available to view on our SlideShare page as well as on our YouTube channel. And after the webinar, we will send you links to, to these two sites. When we finish, um, a survey will pop up. And I just ask that you please give time, time to do the post-webinar survey um, so that we can get your feedback and see how we can do things better. And also, perhaps, other topics that you'd like to have webinars on. As James does his presentation, and if you think of any questions, you can type these in the question box, which you can see at the bottom right of your control panel. Um, James will allocate time to, at the end of the webinar to answer these, unless there's one that's so relevant that he decides to answer it there and then. So with that all said, I'll hand you over to James now. Thank you very much for joining us on this webinar. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you for attending the webinar and welcome uh, to the webinar. So just before we start, two minutes introduction about me. My name is James Graham. I'm from uh, the United Kingdom. I've been working uh, with uh, strategy for, uh, for over 30 years. Um, I spent the first 12 years of my uh, working life in multinational companies, working in uh, senior management functions, sitting on uh, various uh, strategic committees as well as uh, having a line role. And then in 1993, I moved into management consulting and I've gained a lot of global experience, both consulting and also running seminars for Informa here in the, uh, the Middle Eastern region. My speciality is anything to do with uh, formulating strategy or uh, executing strategy. So I have a fairly, uh, fairly broad range of uh, those two areas. So that's enough about me. Let's actually move on to the topic today and have a look at the, uh, the agenda. The first agenda point that um, I'm going to go through is actually the sort of introduction and context about how business strategy um, arose in the 1950s, how it's developed and matured over the uh, next 60 years. And then we're going to look at um, some uh, different strategy techniques as in the title for different approaches to uh, create strategic uh, uh, effective strategies. The first one is going to be what we call the mid-range planning technique. The second one will be market positioning through uh, rigorous analysis. The third one is strategy via a, a process of learning and adapting to fast-moving environments. And uh, finally, Strategy is a collective process to develop and execute a common vision and uh, implement strategies that way. What I'll do at the end then is make sure that we have enough time to answer any of the questions that you may wish to uh, submit uh, during the, uh, the, this, the webinar. As uh, Shuri said a few minutes ago, if you wish to submit a question, please just type it into the bottom right-hand corner and then we'll uh, share the answer with everybody at the end. So here we go. Let's talk about the uh, background of strategy. Strategy has been around for thousands of years, both in the military context and also the commercial context. Uh, the Phoenicians were practicing uh, strategic decision making all across the Mediterranean Sea and the uh, Maghrabi region for literally 2,000 years. But strangely enough, it was only in the early 1950s that um, Anybody started to think about codifying strategy, capturing the details, and, uh, and trying to actually understand how it worked. In fact, it's generally accepted that the first strategic um, book, management book, was published in 1952 by a gentleman called Harry Markovitz, who was interested in taking a joined-up approach to working with portfolios of financial assets. Uh, he developed an approach called the Efficient Frontier which is still used today as a method of trading risk versus maximum uh, benefit from a portfolio of uh, financial products by looking at the interconnectedness in the portfolio and managing it as a whole rather than managing it uh, by some single product by product. 
And this is why it was considered the first strategy book, because uh, Harry Markovitz was thinking about how to manage their total outcome, not just uh, the individual financial products. Then a couple of years later, Peter Drucker started to write a number of works looking at how management works, and part of that was uh, strategy. One of his most famous works in the middle 1950s was to design the management by objective system that many people are still appraised with today, and bonuses and rewards are uh, developed from that, that framework, which links individual reward to corporate objectives. Moving on into the 1960s, the world was still experiencing a period of uh, strong financial growth driven by the Marshall Plan, which was launched in 1945 and basically funded the development of a lot of organizations around the world. And at that time, one of the most important things that you had to be able to do as a business in order to be successful was to be able to plan your uh, development, plan your logistics, plan your supply chain, plan your markets plan the routes to market, and uh, the work of Igor Ansoff was very much based around using uh, mid-range planning to help expansion. Later on, moving into the 1970s, 1980s, things started to change a little bit. The very healthy growth and development in the 50s and 60s and middle 70s started to taper off, and uh, markets around the world became saturated. Uh, now it was no longer good enough just to be able to get the product to market. You had to be able to sell and market your product to consumers and convince them to buy your product in an area where they had much more choice and more alternatives. At this stage, people like Henry Mintzberg, Michael Porter started to develop uh, frameworks to help recognize that the market was becoming more difficult and that you had to do some structured analysis. Also, Theodore Levitt of Harvard Business School started to look at how you could segment customers into different collections or even how you could specialize as a business in only dealing with certain uh, ranges of customers rather than trying to uh, deal with everybody. So there was a transition at this period into uh, what was known as emergent strategy and uh, the analysis of competitive forces, both of which we're going to look at today. Moving on into the 1990s, there were even more changes. We now had uh, people like Gary Hamill and C.K. Prahalad saying what's really important, not only do you have to choose your position in the market and understand who you're dealing with, but you also have to develop the uh, relative competencies in order to take you, uh, take you to success in that market. So, for example, Dell Computer Company were the first people who really pushed the concept of build computers to order and provide on-site servicing. That kind of uh, strategy now is no longer limited to Dell. Virtually every computer company in the world uh, has that functional capability, but it was Michael Dell and Dell Computer who originally uh, figured out that would give them advantage in that market. Also in the 1990s, 1996 to be precise, uh, Doctors Kaplan and Norton of Harvard started to uh, be concerned about focus only on short-term financial performance. And they developed a framework called the Balanced Business Scorecard, followed by strategy maps, which was a way at looking at sustainability and uh, making sure that people had more than uh, single objectives and they had a more balanced business. And finally, in the 2000s, the last sort of big idea in strategy was the concept of the, the so-called blue ocean. That was... Uh, taking a position that was so differentiated that you literally made the competition powerless to uh, be able to uh, compete with you. And that is uh, still a very, very good idea. If you can find a, a position that puts you into an area of uh, little or no competition, uh, that's a very, very healthy space to be in. So I think you can see in the, uh, the 60 years um, between 19... Uh, 52 and the early 2000s, strategy changed and matured in response to the uh, changes in the external world. Having given you that uh, backdrop, what I'm going to do now is to move on and start to talk about some of the individual strategy techniques. So as I say, if you've got any questions, please feel free to add them to the chat and we'll deal with those as uh, either as we get to the end or as we go along. So going back to the time of stability, 
Um, uh, or even today, if you're in a market which is relatively stable, because not all markets are volatile, there's still a very good uh, argument for using the mid-range planning technique. In fact, I suspect most companies use it for things like financial budgeting and forward capacity sizing. As the old saying goes, you plan the flight, you fly the plan. Without a plan, it's difficult to know where you're going. It's difficult to uh, have the right uh, provisions of resources, materials, people, uh, and, uh, and other factors. So this works very well in stable environments where you can predict what's going to happen. You can basically go on the past uh, few years uh, experience. You can look at using regression analysis and other techniques to uh, figure out what's likely to happen. You can plan forward. For example, you can look at the consumption from your customers. You can scale up um, the amount of production capacity to do that. You know, so if you look at the rise of Starbucks, for example, or McDonald's, they did a lot of planning to get the optimum penetration into the market by forward planning. An example of this approach would be Igor Ansoff's diversification grid. Now, I don't know how many people are familiar with this. But uh, let's just go through this grid and, and have a look and see how this can uh, work. You see at the, the top of the screen, you have a, a focus on products, either current and existing products or services or new ex uh, products or services. And to the left side of the grid, we have a focus on, on markets, current markets that we already operate in and new markets that we'd like to operate in in the future. So above the line, if we're working with current products in uh, current markets, our focus is very much on gaining market penetration. And this will be typical in, in any organization like Starbucks, McDonald's. You see that you, you don't have to travel too far around any large city center to notice a number of uh, these outlets working together. And you can be sure there's been some very careful market research done to calculate the optimum area, the optimum footfall, the optimum space that these outlets need so that they don't cannibalize each other's business. But they do keep the brand uh, in the forefront of people's minds and make it easy for those customers to find and use the, the brand. So that would be current current. Moving across onto um, new products in the current market, you would be able to uh, look at um, strategy of product development. <clears throat> Now, if you remember, 20 years ago, McDonald's did very little apart from making burgers and, and soft drinks and fries. These days, if you go into a McDonald's, you have much more diversified products. You have salads, you have chicken meals, all sorts of different meals and a different range of drinks also. You even have the McDonald's cafe offering traditional type of cafe integrated into the, uh, the fast food burger joint uh, environment. That's a classic case of taking new products to your current uh, markets and using your brand and leveraging that to increase your revenues and profitability. Now, below the line, if we look at current products in new markets, that would uh, be very often a question of moving from uh, one city to another. So, for example, McDonald's originally started in the USA, but now they're global. They've found new markets and they've uh, gone into those markets and uh, opened up and uh, expanded those. And again, um, Al Baik in Saudi Arabia, very, very good fast food restaurant, uh, moved originally from working in an area of Jeddah now to a uh, lot of different places in Western province. Finally, if you have new products and new markets, you are looking at diversification. So some examples of uh, diversification would be, for example, um, motor car companies looking at different requirements in new markets and building models that fit into those markets and customizing them and making them fit for purpose. So, for example, four-wheel drives, uh, SUV vehicles in, in areas where there's a market demand for those. So even though this technique is uh, originally going back to the 1950s, 1960s, it's still a classic modeling tool. If you're in a a market or if you're in markets where there is a degree of stability, this kind of modeling is a very, very useful way of understanding how to expand your business, how to reach the optimum levels of uh, business development and market development. 
So that is the concept of mid-range planning. Obviously, there are many other tools as well, but Ansoft's Grid is one that is fairly easy to take on board. And you can see in most businesses an immediate application, even if you're using it alongside other strategic frameworks. The next kind of strategic tool that we'd like to look at is uh, what we call market position through analysis. Now, whereas in uh, Ansoft's grid, we assume that we're going to be able to go in and enter new markets and develop new products, when we're analyzing uh, market position, we're much more aware of the competition. And what we're trying to seek is where is the position, where is the sweet spot that we can take and occupy in a market and we can basically carve out a profitable area for us, even though there's heavy competition. For this reason, market position analysis works better in a narrow industry or sector context. You can't look at the whole market of, say, GCC generally. That's too broad. There'd be too much analysis to do. What you may do is pick something like, for example, the sale of motor cars in the GCC, and then you could start to analyze your competitors, the market channels, the market preferences. And that would start to be very informative in deciding whether to enter that market and if so, how to uh, position yourself in that market. Michael Porter was one of the great drivers of uh, market position through analysis. And Michael Porter is uh, an economist. His um, an analytical models are rigorous and um, very well constructed. This particular form of analysis is what's known as the structure conduct performance model. What this means essentially is if a market is structured in a certain way, so you, you can identify the suppliers, the buyers, possible new entrants, possible substitute products, you can then predict conduct. In other words, people will compete to try and gain market share. And that in turn allows you to uh, gain insights into your competitors' potential performance. What are they likely to do? Are they likely to launch discounted campaigns or are they likely to introduce new products? Now, that's one of the uh, slight downsides or risks that you have to be aware of when you're doing this kind of analysis. If for any reason the structure of the market does not allow for um, perfect competition, then the performance and the conduct may be slightly difficult to predict. So nonetheless, it's a great tool. And in using this to analyze, if you look at the market and you find any slight skews or imperfections in the way the market is put together, what you can do at that stage is then make allowance for that in your analysis and adjust your thinking based on the uh, slight skews in the market setup. The other question that you have to bear in mind as well at this stage is how long does it take to uh, gather the analysis or to gather the data for the analysis? Uh, if you're in a relatively slow moving market, then it may well be very, very easy to collect the data, and make decisions and alter your position. But if you're in a very fast moving market, for example, like um, smartphones, it could be that the uh, data collection takes longer than the market takes to change. So although you may use some of the principles of uh, uh, market position analysis, it may well be that you have to abbreviate your data and work uh, more quickly to allow yourself to react before those markets change. So that's just, that's just a, something you have to bear in mind. All strategic tools and techniques and frameworks have limitations. It doesn't mean that they are no longer useful, but it just means you have to interpret the uh, information that you're gaining from using these models in the context of the upside benefits and downside risks of that particular model. Now, we also uh, have an example to share today of a typical market position analysis model. And this is the classic uh, Michael Porter Five Forces analysis, which uh, he released uh, initially in his book, uh, Competitive Advantage in 1985. But it's still as valid today as it was in those days. I mean, if you'd taken this model back 2,000 years to the days of the Phoenician, the Phoenicians would have recognized this model and would have been able to apply it to their cross-Mediterranean tra uh, trading. The principle is that the circle in the middle uh, allows you to assess the rivalry amongst the 
industry competitors. Let's say that you are making uh, a particular product. You're competing with other people who make that product as well. For example, soft drinks. You will have bargaining power with, power with your suppliers. If you, if you um, are buying uh, the raw materials of soft drink, you will have pretty high bargaining power because the materials are total commodities. You're talking about water, sugar, one or two other contents, flavoring, that kind of thing. You can get them anywhere. They're not high technology and uh, they're pretty easy things to make. That means that uh, you should be able to uh, multi-source and get good deals on those. However, your rivals will also be bargaining, trying to get good deals. So you have to make sure that your supply chain is competitive and uh, lean and mean and fast and giving you good products. Equally, you have bargaining power on the buyer side. So who are the people who buy soft drinks, if we take that as an example? Well, it's people like you and me. We're consumers. How much bargaining power realistically do we have with PepsiCo or Coca-Cola? Not very much, but we go and shop at, at places like Lulu or Carrefour or uh, Walmart in the USA, and those stores understand the power of the brand. They know if they stock those brands on the stores, we'll buy them from the, uh, uh, the supermarkets. So they have uh, strong bargaining power with the suppliers because they can buy very, very large quantities of those drinks. So there will be a rivalry between the different suppliers of soft drinks to get the best shelf positions with the supermarkets to get the best promotional deals. So these are two sets of market forces and they will determine uh, how intense the rivalry is in that market. And I think we would all realize that in the Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola soft drinks market, that rivalry is uh, extremely intense. Now, if we look above the, uh, the, the circle in the middle, we see a box with the word potential entrance in there. Potential entrance refers to uh, new, uh, new uh, companies entering the market, creating products. And we often talk about the barriers to entry. So, for example, if you want to become an aircraft manufacturer, you've got very heavy barriers to entry because of regulation, the immense investment costs in building factories, making designs, testing. So that would be very difficult to do that. In one respect, entering the Coca-Cola or soft drinks business would be very easy. You have a relatively low cost plant, you have abundant supplies of raw materials, and it's relatively easy to make a decent soft drink. However, the, the biggest barrier to entry in, in the soft drink market is not actually physically making the drink, it's the power of the brand. So if I launch James Cola tomorrow, is everybody on this call, call going to go out and buy it rather than Pepsi or, or Coke? I very much doubt it. Uh, if I thought they would do, I would have already gone into that business. So the brand is a barrier, and the, that's why the large soft drinks companies spend so much money, literally millions and millions of dirhams advertising and promoting their products every year to maintain that brand differentiation and maintain that barrier to entry for other uh, entrants. Finally, moving below the uh, circle in the middle, we have the threat of substitute products. So we have soft drinks. What about health drinks? What about fruit drinks, water-based drinks? Potentially, we have many, many different substitute products. However, barriers to entry, again, tend to be things like the brand, brand loyalty, preference for one taste over another. So the reality is, although it's a, a fiercely intense market, the big players, uh, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola Corporation, manage to um, compete very heavily with each other and put up strong enough barriers by developing their brands to mean that they're able to dominate that market, um, use their position to be number one and two in the soft drinks industry. So you can see already, even with a very short explanation of how this model works, you could see the use this model can be uh, applied for in actually looking at markets and understanding what's likely to happen. Should you enter? Should you exit? Should you develop new products? So that's the uh, market position analysis approach. Now, we already mentioned in the 1980s, uh, growth slowed, competition invest. Uh, intensified, it became harder to do business. 
and the so-called deliberate strategy of mid-range planning was no longer totally effective. And it was at this stage that we developed the concept of emergent strategy. Uh, Professor Henry Mintzberg of uh, McGill University in uh, Canada was one of the first people who published and wrote some excellent works such as the rise and fall of strategic planning to say that actually, if you're not careful these days, uh, your reaction speed, if you're planning too far ahead, will be slow and your competitors will become more agile and be able to overtake you and, um, and take over your market space. This is particularly true in areas where you have disruptive technologies. I note recently that uh, Nokia uh, launched a tablet in China in conjunction with Foxconn. Foxconn, who make Apple computers, I believe, and others for them, uh, built the tablet. The Nokia brand was used to sell it. They sold the entire stock in uh, seven minutes, and it generated revenues of uh, four billion US dollars. I mean, that is just incredible. There isn't time to uh, gather too much data in four minutes, that's right, in seven minutes. So emergent strategy is crucial. What do we mean by emergent strategy? Well, we start off with a deliberate strategy. We, we, we don't start off by saying we've got to go out and do some stuff next year. We generally start off by identifying some objectives and then we try and choose the strategies uh, which will tell us how we uh, are we going to go out and turn those objectives into our realized strategy. And then things happen, things happen in the market which we don't have control over. And we call this turbulence. The turbulence disrupts our smooth uh, transition from deliberate to realized strategy. And uh, we have to uh, then use emergent strategy to work around that uh, turbulence and still get through to the original or mar marginally changed uh, realized strategy at the end. So we're not necessarily talking about completely changing what we're trying to achieve. What we're talking about is changing the way we get to realize that to make sure that we stay agile, to make sure that we can uh, be competitive and uh, make sure that our competitors don't win and we lose. Uh, one uh, way that we can do this is by literally using learning and speed of learning in particular as a way of realizing what we need to do. So if we set goals, and if we realize we're not going to achieve those goals unless we change, we can then analyze what's changed in the environment, why are we not achieving these goals, and we can then use that learning to uh, reformulate uh, our strategies and then become successful. Now, John Cotter at Harvard Business School says it's not actually dealing with change that is the immediate problem. Everybody can do that. It's whether you can deal with change more quickly than your competition. In other words, uh, Professor Minsberg would also say the rate of learning is the key important thing. If you learn faster than your competitors, if you can use that learning, then you will maintain a good business, you'll be a powerful company. And if you look at organizations such as Apple, they're very, very good at understanding what their customer base wants. They're very, very good at providing that. And they're very good at doing that quickly and iterating products so that they maintain their preeminent position in the marketplace. So, so far, we've looked at um, three alternative ways of uh, creating effective strategies. The final method we're going to look at is um, basically using the concept of having a common vision. Uh, common vision is uh, really about creating alignment of thinking, alignment of behavior between the people who are active uh, in our organization. What we want to avoid are people making different decisions that, that clash, even though they're trying to do the right thing. Let me give you a simple example of that. Let's say that the CEO of an organization sets the, the, the board of directors as a target. We want to increase the profitability in our organization by 5% within the next uh, 12 months. That's a very realistic business strategy. It focuses attention and it gives people a tangible uh, aim uh, and objective to go for. Now, Without alignment, what may happen is that the marketing director says, okay, we want to increase revenues and profitability. The easiest way to increase uh, profitability 
is to gain more clients. The more clients we have, uh, the more profit we're going to make. So I'm going to spend a large amount of money on a very, very focused, very, very effective marketing campaign. At the same time, the finance director could go away and think, you know what? The best way to increase profitability of this organization is increase the gap between our cost of doing business and our revenues. So I'm going to reduce our cost and that as a default will create more profit. So then the marketing director and finance director may experience conflict because although they're both trying to increase profitability, they're not doing it in an aligned way. So giving people a common purpose, aligning things, uh, allows you to make sense of the big picture and turn that into an actionable item. One of the most uh, common frameworks that people will recognize in this area is the so-called VMOS model, which starts off with the concept that the organization has a vision of why it exists and possibly backed up by corporate values. This in turn sets a number of goals assembled into a mission for the organization to achieve. This doesn't necessarily mean financial objectives, but it should be something concrete. One of the mission statements that's generally accepted as being a very good example was John F. Con Kennedy when he announced the Apollo Space Program in the USA in 1962. And he said, by the end of the decade, this country should send a man safely to the moon and return him safely to Earth. That was a very, very clear goal. They didn't talk about cost or engineering targets or things like that. Uh, JFK wasn't an engineer, he was a politician. He wanted to set the people a clear vision of what he wanted them to achieve and then let them go out and work out the details of that. You know, once we know our objectives, we can get those from our vision. We can then look at the strategies and the strategic themes and the day-to-day -day key actions to uh, achieve those objectives. Now, I'm going to give you an example of uh, strategic intent. Strategic intent is a method of helping people to understand in the short term how to deliver the vision. I'm sure you're all familiar with, with Honda, the motor car manufacturer from Japan. Going back to the early 1990s, Honda had a big dream. Honda's objective was to become an upmarket uh, high quality car production producer. At the time, they were relatively low end or mid end market. There is a, a picture of a Honda Civic from the early 1980s. It was a typical kind of student car or low income family car. It was efficient, it did the job, but you couldn't confuse that with an upscale upmarket uh, motor car. So Honda set a very, very big stretch question for their organization. They challenged them to beat Benz. We must beat Benz. Four simple words, no detail. They wanted people to go out and challenge themselves. How can we beat Benz? If you're an engineer, what were the success factors that made Benz good? If you were a, a finance guy, how did Benz finance their business? Everybody was able to look at this very, very large statement of strategic intent through their own lens, their own focus, their own discipline. And that enabled them to effectively benchmark themselves against a company at the time, which was the probably the most respected mass car manufacturer in the world at the top end of the market. Now, I think you could say today that Honda hasn't yet beaten Benz, but 20 years later, what they have done is moved up markets uh, considerably. They're now considered a very good brand, a lot higher brand than they used to be. And you can see that the latest Honda Civic is almost recognizable, unrecognizable compared to the original one. So this kind of focus backed up by good research and development, good investment in the business has allowed people to work in alignment and move the car from being just one of many mid-scale producers to a car that now carries a, a premium in certain areas. Well, I appreciate you being with us today. I've now been talking for about uh, 35 minutes. I appreciate you staying with me. I appreciate you uh, being on the line. What I'd like to do is to um, uh, just move on and give you the ability to ask any questions. So, 
let's see if we have any questions that you would uh, like to ask us. Okay, thanks for that. The first question is, which is the best type of strategic approach out of the four that I've talked about today? Um, unfortunately, there isn't um, an absolutely straight answer to that because it depends on the situation that you're in. Basically, strategy comes down to three very, very clear things. Number one is my context. What's the situation? What's the market? Uh, number two is what are the complications preventing me from succeeding? So in other words, what are my competitor activities? How quickly does the market change? Uh, how established are we? How strong is our brand? And then the third aspect is what is our solution? What's the explanation of how we're going to move from where we are to where we want to be? And that, again, that is, uh, that is strategy. Our strategic decisions, choices, actions will uh, allow us to succeed in the market. And depending on the con context of the market, uh, really will determine what combination of these strategic frameworks you want to, uh, want to use. So there are also more strategic frameworks. I've picked four of them today for the webinar. Uh, depending on who you believe, there are between another six or 20 different types of strategic frameworks that you can employ. Okay, so I hope that's answered the question. The, the second question is, uh, are these particular alternatives suitable for one market sector or another? No, the answer is no. On that one, I can give you a clear answer. These are generic type of strategic frameworks. You can apply them to any kind of, uh, of business sector. And it's the context of that business sector rather than the sector that will determine which one you want to use. I think we've just got time for one more question. I can just see somebody typing one in at the moment. And the question is, yes, that is, uh, that's a very, very good question. How is strategy going to change in the future? Um, well, I'm not very good at looking forward into the future, but if you ask me what my, my best guess is today, I think it's going to get more competitive because the markets around the world are becoming more and more saturated. We're getting more and more suppliers. We're getting oversupply. You're going to have to get a lot faster at um, learning and be very, very careful to choose sustainable market positions. And therefore, the strategies to the future is going to have to be fast-footed, learn quickly, and have a very, very good range of different analytical tools to allow them to make sense of what's happening in potentially turbulent uh, markets. So what I'm going to do now is hand back to Shuri to say a few final words. Uh, no, she's saying I can say the few final words. So basically, uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for attending this webinar. On behalf of Informa, um, we hope you've got some benefit. Please take the time to give us the survey questionnaires uh, that you see as you exit the webinar. And and uh, hopefully, one of these days, we may see you on one of the strategic programs that uh, inform us, such as Certificate in Strategic Thinking and Planning or uh, Strategic Business Planning. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Inshallah, have a very, very pleasant evening. And one day, inshallah, hope to meet you at one of the seminars.